1995, a professor at Columbia University named Andrew Del Banco, he published a book entitled The Death of Satan with the subtitle, How Americans Have Lost the Sense of Evil. In that book, Del Banco, who interestingly is a self-proclaimed secular liberal, not really a religious person himself, he makes a very interesting observation. We live in a time, he says, in which we experience and are exposed to more horrors than almost any other time in history. And yet, for some reason, we seem to have lost an ability to name these horrors for what they are. Earlier Americans, he said, were very aware that they lived in a world in which evil not only existed, but was perf personified in the form of a specific evil tempter who is actively seeking to lure them into destruction. But now, now we seem to have lost that awareness. We don't think about the devil very much. We certainly don't fear him. We can talk about wrongs, but we no longer have a way to name evil for what it is. The repertoire of evil, he says, has never been richer, yet never have our responses been so weak. We have no language for connecting our inner lives with the horrors that pass before our eyes in the outer world. And yet, there's no escaping it. Evil is real. Because the world in which we live isn't just one where people occasionally do bad things or commit wrongs. Bad behavior and wrongdoing can be understood. There's an explanation for it, but not evil. There is something mysterious, something sinister, something inexplicable, a force behind evil. But take, for instance, the actions of a unit of 500 German police officers. They were known as the Reserve Police Battalion 101. And when their unit was formed in 1939, they were all in their 30s, a little too old to be drafted into the regular German army, but young enough and healthy enough to help with the war effort. So they were middle-aged men, ordinary men. They worked ordinary jobs. They were ordinary neighbors. Most of them were married and had nice, ordinary families. And yet, within several years, these ordinary men were committing some of the most extraordinary atrocities imaginable. They captured and hauled away tens of thousands of Jewish families, taking them from their homes and forcing them into concentration camps. And then beginning in 1942, they began to exterminate Jews throughout Poland. Within the span of a year and a half in 1942 and 43, this ordinary group of 500 middle-aged men were solely responsible for the murder of 83,000 Jews. That's a true story. That is the world in which we live. A world of cruelty, suffering, and inexplicable horrors. And that's why we must continue to pray, as Jesus taught us to pray. Deliver us from evil. This is the last petition of the Lord's Prayer. And when you think about it, that seems rather odd. After all, doesn't this seem like a rather low and pessimistic, pessimistic note to end on as your final request? Why not make the final petition a, a request for something more joyful? Well, maybe it's because Jesus is just a little bit more realistic than we are. Many Christians like to think that if they follow God, then they can expect their lives to be filled with happiness and prosperity and blessing. But Jesus doesn't think like that. Jesus knows that his followers will experience their fair share of suffering and pain. In fact, he tells them so. In the world, he says, you will have tribulation. Of course, that tribulation, that suffering can take many forms. At times, it may take the form of sickness or death either our own or those we love. At other times, it may take the form of cruelty or hatred. You can experience tribulation from the destruction of a storm or the betrayal of trusted friends or the loss of a job or a home. Now, we could choose to ignore or minimize suffering, 
that we experience. But Jesus doesn't. He doesn't pretend that we live in a world in which everything's okay or that things always happen, good things always happen to good people. He knows that we live in a world of senseless evils. He expects them. And he knows that we can't really control them. And so Jesus teaches us to pray, deliver us from evil. Now, you might notice if you read this prayer in your Bible that there are different translations of this petition. In the English Standard Version, which is often the translation that I reference, the petition reads, deliver us from evil. But the New International Version translates it differently. Instead of saying, deliver us from evil, this version says, deliver us from the evil one. Oh, why this discrepancy? Well, unfortunately, it's not really something that can be decided just by an appeal to the grammar or the wording of the original language. Both of these translations are reasonable renderings of this phrase into English. And for a lot of Christian history, at least in the Western church, the evil from which we are asking to be delivered has been understood to include a wide variety of evils, the evil of suffering, the evil of death, and especially the evil of our own sin. And if that's what we're asking deliverance from, then it makes good sense to simply pray, deliver us from evil. But that's not how everyone has understood this prayer. Some of the early Greek-speaking church fathers, like Origen and Cyril of Alexandria, for instance, they, they understood this petition to be not so much a request for deliverance from general evils or just the evil of human sin, but more specifically, to be a request for deliverance from Satan, the evil one himself, the one who lives to tempt and deceive and destroy God's creatures. And the fact is, both of these ways of understanding this petition, they both have a strong biblical basis. In books like Judges and the Psalms, we find numerous prayers asking God to deliver his people from the evils of pain and suffering in their own sin. A lot of prayers of simply deliver us from evil. So it makes perfect sense for us to ask for deliverance from all sorts of evil. But the Bible also recognizes that there is a, a personal malevolent force behind the evil in the world. Now, there are different names for this personal evil. The tempter, the deceiver, the devil, Lucifer. And Jesus himself is visited by this evil one in the wilderness, and he has to do battle with him. And the New Testament tells us in very plain terms that this evil one is real and is out to get us. Be sober-minded. Be watchful, 1 Peter says. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Likewise, the Apostle Paul warns us in Ephesians that even if we can't see it, we are caught up in a very real battle with an evil spiritual force. Put on the whole armor of God, he says, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. There was a time when Christians were acutely aware of this evil enemy. There was a time when they knew just how crafty he was and just how susceptible they were. But like Andrew Del Banco said, we Americans have largely lost that sense of the reality and presence of the evil one. We don't take him that seriously anymore. And that's really to our detriment because it means that we aren't being watchful, as Peter said, or we're not guarding ourselves against the devil's attacks, as Paul told us to do. And that's also why sometimes, even if you normally pray, if you normally pray in your prayer, deliver us from evil, 
Sometimes it's a good thing to change it up and to say, deliver us from the evil one because it will remind you that the evil one is real, that we are susceptible to his attack. And because of that, that sometimes, apart from the deliverance and help of God, sometimes ordinary people are capable of extraordinary evil. But of course, deliverance from evil, it's not the only thing that we pray for in this final petition. You might notice that I skipped over the first half of this final request of the Lord's Prayer. I started by talking about evil, and so I jumped right over that previous line, lead us not into temptation. Well, you'd be glad to know that that wasn't a mistake. I wasn't just trying to avoid it. I did that for a reason. I, I wanted to begin by talking about evil and the devil because I think it can help us better understand what's often a very misunderstood phrase in this prayer. In 2017, during an interview on an Italian television show, Pope Francis suggested that this phrase of the Lord's Prayer is badly translated and that the wording needs to be changed. It isn't right to pray, lead us not into temptation, the Pope said, because that makes it sound as if God may very well be inducing us to sin. And that's just not right. I am the one who falls, the Pope said. It's not God pushing me into temptation to then see how I have fallen. A father doesn't do that. A father helps you get up immediately. It's Satan who leads us into temptation. That's his department. There's a lot of truth to what the Pope was saying there. The Bible is quite clear in its insistence that God does not induce us to sin. As James chapter 1 verse 13 says very plainly, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. And the Pope is also correct in saying that some people, when they say, lead us not into temptation, some people are confused because Sounds as if God may indeed do just that. But God doesn't tempt us to sin, as James says. That's the work of the evil one. And yet, that doesn't quite resolve things. Because while Pope Francis may be theologically correct, the fact of the matter is that the original wording of the prayer, it does indeed say, lead us not into temptation. It's a good translation. So how are we to make sense of this? If God doesn't tempt us to sin, if that's the work of Satan, then what exactly are we asking for? Well, it helps to know something about this word for temptation. In the original Greek, it's the word perosmos. It's a word that has some ambiguity in its meaning. Sometimes, sometimes it does indeed refer to what Pope Francis was talking about, to a to a temptation to sin. Now take the way that Paul uses the word in 1 Timothy, for instance. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. In that case, the temptation Paul is referring to, it's obviously a temptation of desire that leads a person to sin. But at other times, that same word can refer not to temptation to sin, but instead to an experience of trial or testing. Like in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal when it comes upon you to test you. Or again in James chapter 1, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of many kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. On these occasions, this word doesn't refer to a temptation or inducement to do something wrong, to sin, but instead to a time of testing or trial. And it's clear that sometimes God not only allows us to experience these trials, but he actually uses them, as James says, for our good. So how then should we understand what are we praying when we say, lead us not into temptation. Well, first we need to be clear what we're not praying. 
We're not praying that God would not tempt us to sin because we already know that he never does. We're also not asking for God to spare us from any trial or testing in life because we know that he does in fact test us and he uses trials for our good. Instead, what we're praying is that God would not allow us to be so overcome by trial or testing in life that we do in fact fall into sin. That's why in the New Anglican Prayer Book, there's a alternative option for this prayer, alternative translation. Instead of lead us not into temptation, it says, save us from the time of trial. Because that's what we really need. Because we know we will face testing and trial. Jesus promised it. All that we're asking for is that God would enable us to withstand that testing. And as Pope Francis said, that we would not fall into sin. And we should pray that and pray it urgently and pray it seriously because sin is serious. Because evil is real. And we cannot face it on our own. We need deliverance. And so we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.